Hello dear students. Now let us start with chapter number 7 that is the fifth heads of income. Income from other sources which we can say shortly IFOS. From section 56 till section 59 it ranges up to IFOS. Now the question arises sir in which particular manner IFOS income is taxable? The year in which it is received or the year in which it is accrued? The answer is section 145. Section 145 says that the IFOS income will be taxable as per the method of accounting followed by SSE. Can I say the same line was written in PGBP also? Means PGBP and IFOS both will be taxable as per method of accounting. Now let us see an overview of which are the common incomes that are taxable under IFOS. First of all dividend, then casual income, winning from lottery, crossword puzzles, card game, other games. Income from interest on securities, if it is not taxable in PGBP, then it will be taxable over here. Income from machinery, plant or furniture let on hire, if it is not your business, then it will be taxable over here. Then income from letting plant, machinery, furniture along with building. So if you are also renting on building, with that you are giving on a rent to some machinery, plant etc. It is a composite rent. Whatever is the rent belonging to the house property, it will be taxable under the head house property. Whatever is the rent belonging to this particular asset, if it is not your business, then it will be taxable under IFOS. Then, sum of money or property received either without consideration or with inadequate consideration, which in short we can say gift income. Interest received on compensation or enhanced compensation. Share premium in excess of fair market value. All the things we will be looking in detail, but... Understand wherever I have put this asterisk marks, dividend income, casual income, gift income, interest and share premium in excess of fair market value. Even though it is related to business, still it will be always taxable under the head IFOS. So remember dividend for a share broker, IFOS income, casual income, if it is the main business, still IFOS income. It is always IFOS income. Now the very first and the important topic of this chapter is dividend. Remember. Any dividend which is declared paid by a company to the shareholder or by a cooperative society to the member or any person. If it is a dividend income, it is always taxable to the recipient under the head income from other sources. At slab rate, dividend is a slab rate income, not a special rate income. Here, the word dividend may be a normal dividend, may be an interim dividend. It also includes the word dim dividend. Now, what is dimmed dividend? Dim dividend means the dividend which is assumed to be the dividend even though it is not actually as per companies act but still income tax has assumed that it is dividend. In section 2 clause 22 they have mentioned this five kinds of dim dividend. See in that five clauses 222a to 222e up to 222d it is not that important 222e more important. So let us understand first of all 222a till 222d dimmed dividend. The very first is, you remember one thing, whenever a company is giving the asset to the shareholder, distributing the asset, asset to the shareholder, for company it will be like a gift, not taxable for the shareholder, it is receipt of reserve and surplus and that's why, whenever a company distribute the asset to the shareholder, for the recipient of that shareholder, whatever is the fair market value of that asset, it will be taxable under IFOS. Now, if it is at the time of liquidation, then section 222c, other than liquidation, 222a. Now let's say the fair market value of the asset which is distributed is 100 rupees. The reserve and surplus of company is only rupees 90. So dim dividend will be rupees 90. Means this dim dividend cannot exceed the accumulated profit of the company which we can say reserve and surplus. Second, whenever a company distributes debenture without taking any money, to shareholder that is equity shareholder or preference shareholder that is dim dividend for the recipient or whenever a company distribute preference shareholder the bonus shares so what company is distributing bonus shares to whom preference shareholder for preference shareholders it will be treated as dim dividend point to be noted is if bonus is given to equity shareholder it is not dim dividend if it is given to preference shareholder it is dim dividend 222c we already saw and last, whenever a company is doing reduction of the share capital without taking away the share capital, just reducing the value, the paid up capital, waiving of the paid up capital, 
that is actually and paying some of the amount against that that is also called as dim dividend because capital asset is not transferred so capital gain cannot be attracted so whatever money shareholder is receiving it is dimmed dividend up to the amount of reserve and surplus now the more important topic is 222e this 222e is applicable only to a company in which public is not substantially interested means closely held company which other words we can say unlisted company it may be unlisted private company unlisted public company if such kind of company is giving a loan loan or advance to the shareholder and if the shareholder is having at least 10 percentage share holding in the company so who is giving the loan a unlisted company to whom to a shareholder who is having at least 10 percentage of the share capital then loan or reserve and surplus whichever is lower that amount will become dim dividend for that shareholder. Now, even though tomorrow that shareholder is going to repay the loan, still it does not have any impact, amount will be taxable. So, what they have written, distribution of accumulated profit by way of advance or loan to the shareholder is treated as dim dividend to the extent of accumulated profit. Ha, while calculating this accumulated profit, please do not include bonus share values, that is a capitalized profit is not to be said as reserve and surplus. Now, 222E is applicable when number one, loan advance given by the company in which public is not substantially interested, a closely held company, plus that shareholder should be having at least 10 percentage of the share holding. Then, up to the amount of accumulated profit, it will be dim dividend. Otherwise, the balance amount is not treated as dim dividend. Now, let's say I am a company in which my shareholder is having at least 10 percentage shares. I want to transfer the money to this shareholder. So, what I am doing, here it is an unlisted company, here it is the shareholder, company is giving the loan to a partnership firm and this is a firm in which this shareholder is having at least 20% profit sharing. So, can I say, the company has not given the loan to the shareholder, company has given the loan to a concern and in that concern, shareholder of the company is substantially interested. So, government has assumed that indirectly you are passing on the money to that shareholder only. And that's why what is the second point over here? Loan given to the concern of the shareholder is treated as dim dividend if number one, loan or advance given by an unlisted company and number two, it is given to the concern in which our shareholder who is having at least 10% shareholding is substantially interested in that concern that is at least 20% profit sharing or you know profit sharing or equity shares. So, two conditions are here over there. The lending company in that the shareholder should have at least 10% shareholding the borrowing company in that the shareholder should be having at least 20% borrowing concern that is the substantial interest. If it is so, up to the amount of reserve and surplus it will be treated as dim dividend. However, two things are there, two kind of loan or advances are there which will never be called as dim dividend. Number one, if the lending company is into the business of giving the loan like bank is there, NBFC is there, etc, etc. So, giving loan is in ordinary course of business. And number two, advances are given to the shareholder which is like a trade advance for the benefit of the company. So, if company has given the advance to the shareholder for paying certain amount to third party on behalf of company. So, it is in the benefit of the company. It is a trade advance. It has nothing to do with personal relationship of company and shareholder. And that's why it won't be treated as dim dividend for the shareholder. Now, remember section 8. Notwithstanding anything contained in section 145, that means your books of account doesn't matter. If dividend income is there, if it is a normal dividend, then it will be taxable in the year, in the year in which it is declared. However, if it is deemed dividend or interim dividend, it is taxable in the year in which it is paid or distributed to the shareholder. So, normal dividend taxable in the year of declaration, dim dividend and interim dividend taxable in the year of payment to the shareholder. But remember one point, dividend is now taxable to each and every shareholder under IFOS at the slab rates. Now, regarding the deduction from dividend income that we will see in section 57, wait for that. The next income is section 56 subsection 2 clause 1b, casual income. If you have winning from lottery, crossword puzzles, card game, other games, gambling, betting, this kind of income, which totally depends on luck, it will be taxable to the recipient under section 115BB at the rate of 30%. Remember, against this income, you cannot claim any expenditure. 
you cannot claim any deduction under chapter 6a even you cannot have shifting benefit also however rebate under 87a is available if your total income is less than or equal to 5 lakh let me give you an example let's say i earned the lottery income of rupees 5 lakh and you must be knowing which i have written a note also that payer of this casual income will deduct TDS at the rate of 30% under section 194B or 194BB if the income is more than 10,000. That will learn in TDS chapter also. So let's say 5 lakh is my casual income. From that 30% TDS is deducted, balance 350,000 is paid in my account. To earn this lottery income, 1 lakh rupees is the cost of lottery ticket. First of all, under IFOS, how much income I will be adding? I will be adding the total income of 5 lakh rupees. Remember, you cannot take any deduction against a special rate income, specifically a casual income. You cannot take any deduction. So, how much income you will add into IFOS? The answer is rupees 5 lakh. Now, against this 5 lakh, directly you will be calculating the tax. But how much tax you will be calculating at the rate of 30% under section 115 B? 5 lakh into 30% will be what? 1 lakh 50,000 plus you have to add 4% says. Remember, here there will be no shifting benefit. Even though your basic exemption limit is unexhausted, you cannot deduct against a special rate income, specifically casual income. 150 plus 4% that will become 1 lakh 56,000. But can I say already my TDS has been deducted? But wait, this is wrong. Why? From 5 lakh rupees of income, what will be the tax under 115BB? 1 lakh 50,000. But can I say my total income is less than or equal to 5 lakh? I am a resident individual. Rebate under section 87A will be applicable maximum up to 12,500. Tell me what will be my balance tax? 1 lakh 50,000 minus 12,500. 137,500. Now add 4% health and education says. So your tax will be 1 lakh 43,000. How much TDS is already deducted? 1,50,000. So what will be the balance payment? 7,000 refund of the tax. Are you understanding this overall picture people? Yes or no? So against the income of section 115BB, remember, you can't claim any expense, you can't claim any deduction, you can't have shifting benefit, but you can claim the rebate if your total income is less than or equal to 5 lakh. The very next point which is there. Now friends, the very next topic, 56 subsection 2, clause 7b. Share premium in excess of fair market value. This provision is applicable if you are an unlisted company. You are receiving the amount for your share capital from a resident shareholder. And that shareholder is paying you the amount which is over and above fair market value then whatever is the amount over and above the fair market value that much will be treated as your IFOS income but the point to be noted is if you have issued the shares at discount even though above market value but if it is issued in discount there won't be any kind of taxability so see what are the condition recipient is an unlisted company company receives consideration for shares from a resident shareholder plus consideration exceeds the face value that is the shares are issued at premium if all the above conditions are fulfilled, then whatever is the amount of issue price minus fair market value, that will be taxable. And if it is issued at discount, then this concept is not applicable. For example, my face value of the share is 100 rupees. The fair market value is 150 rupees. I have issued the share at 180 rupees. Then 30 rupees will be taxable. This will be the IFOS income of the company who is receiving this. If listed company is receiving this, not taxable. If you are receiving from a non-resident, again, not taxable. Are you understanding my point, people? Yes or no? Then, section 56, subsection 2, clause 8. Interest on compensation or interest on enhanced compensation. You remember one thing. Whenever you are receiving interest on compensation or enhanced compensation because government has paid you the compensation late, that interest will always be taxable in the year of receipt and fully it won't be taxable. It will be taxable after taking 50% standard deduction. But once you have taken 50% standard deduction, you can't claim any other deduction. So, interest on compensation always taxable under IFOS in the year in which receipt as per 145B after 50% standard deduction as per section 57. Are you understanding this? This is one more thing that you will forget in exam. Then, section 56, subsection 2, clause 10, one of the very important sections of IFOS chapter, gift income. 
whenever you are receiving a gift it will be taxable provided you should be receiving it above 50000 in a year either it can be in cash or it can be as a property movable property or immovable property this section is applicable from 1st october 2009 that means if you would have received the gift prior to this date it would not have been taxable to you now there are total five transactions in gift income number 1 sum of money without consideration means you are receiving money either through cash or through bank account without any consideration if in a year whatever gift you have received the total amount of that exceeds 50000 then entire gift income will be taxable that entire amount the second transaction movable property received without consideration you are receiving some movable property shares jewelry archaeological collection painting drawing sculpture work of any art bullion and you are receiving it without consideration then see what is the total gift amount what is the total fair market value of such gift during the entire year in total if it is exceeding 50000 per annum the entire fair market value will be taxable the point to be noted is the limit of 50000 for sum of money is different and the limit of 50000 for movable property without consideration is different all the five transaction has separate limit of 50000 third one movable property received with inadequate consideration let's say i purchase the jewelry of fair market value 70000 through bank account i only paid 10000 so how much gift i have 60000 rupees of gift difference is 60000 this difference should be more than 50000 in a year if it is more than 50000 entire difference over here 60000 will be taxable so if movable property received with inadequate consideration you please see what is the fair market value whether it exceeds the consideration for 50000 if yes then entire difference will be taxable then fourth one immovable property received without consideration you are receiving land or building with no consideration then see what is the stamp duty per transaction here you have to see per transaction not per annum if the stamp duty of the property which you have received in gift it exceeds rupees 50000 that entire stamp duty will be taxable and the last one you received inadequate consider you received immovable property at inadequate consideration you have to see what is the difference amount if that difference amount is more than 50000 and it is also more than 10% of actual consideration that difference will be taxable in ifrs let me give you one example so that you can better understand this provision let's say here mr x is there here mr y is there mr x is a seller and mr y is a buyer seller is selling one property to the buyer and the value for which the property is being sold the actual value is coming to 20 lakh but the stamp duty value is let's say 23 lakh now for whom which income will be attracted first of all for the seller can i say capital gain income will be attracted and in capital gain income we have to take full value of consideration now there is a section section 50c which says that whenever your stamp duty value is more than 110% that stamp duty value will become your full value of consideration here can i say stamp duty is more than 110% yes or no yes and that's why 23 lakh rupees will be treated as full value of consideration the same goes for the buyer can i say the buyer is purchasing the immovable property with inadequate consideration because he has paid rupees 3 lakh lower so it is inadequate consideration so for the buyer section 56 subsection 2 clause 10 will get applicable now tell me what is the difference in this 3 lakh rupees this difference should exceed by two things number 1 50000 yes it is more than 50000 number 2 it should be more than 10% of actual value actual value is 20 lakh 10% is rupees 2 lakh the difference is more than rupees 2 lakh so can i say this difference of 3 lakh will be taxable under which section 56 sub section 2 clause 10 yes there is a double taxation for the seller also that 3 lakh is taxable for the buyer also this 3 lakh will be taxable but for the buyer under ifos for the seller under capital gain now the question arises sir this stamp duty should be taken on which date it should be to, to be taken for on the date of registration but the same rule if on the date of agreement you have paid at least some of the consideration by that four mode account pay check account pay draft ecs or other electronic mode then we will take stamp duty on the date of agreement means option is available 
Now, some of the cases are there in which section 56 subsection 2 clause 10 is not applicable. Now, which are the cases in which this gift income will not be taxable? Number one, if you receive the gift from any of the relative, if you receive the gift from relative for crores or crores rupees, it will never be taxable. Now, who are called as relative? See working note number two, which I have prepared. The meaning of relative. If you are talking about individual, your spouse is your relative, brother or sister is relative, real brother or sister. Brother or sister of the spouse is also your relative for this section. Brother or sister of either of the parents of mine, yani for example, mother's mother, uh, sorry, mother's brother or mother's sister, father's brother or father's sister, all of them are my relative, uncle and auntie, but it should be real brother and sister. Then, lineal ascendant and descendant, if I am talking about myself, then my parents, grandparents, descendant means my child, grandchild like this, lineal ascendant or descendant, lineal ascendant or descendant of spouse and spouse of all of the above, all of these are called as relative so far as this gift income is concerned. So, if you receive gift from any of this person, yes, it will never be taxable. For HUF, the members of the HUF will be called as relative for HUF, means if HUF receives gift from any of this member, for HUF it will never be taxable. There is no relative for a partnership firm for a company AOP BOI so far as gift income section is concerned. One more comedy thing that to be we can see from this relative definition. For a person his uncle is relative. Mother's brother or father's brother like that. But for them you are not relative. Because brother's children is not covered. So for nephew uncle is relative. For uncle nephew is not a relative. Are you understanding my point? So, if you receive gift from relative, it is never taxable. Second, if you receive gift on the occasion of your own marriage, whatever gift you receive at the time of marriage, even it is not taxable. If you receive any asset under will or inheritance, succession, that is also not taxable. If you receive something from local authority, never taxable. And last, if you receive any gift from a trust or charitable institute, which is registered under 1023C, 12AA12AB, even it is not taxable. So, what I can say is, in a general sense, gift income is taxable only if it is received from non-relative, other than on the occasion of marriage, exceeding rupees 50,000 per kind of transaction. Now, here one more point. They have said movable property taxable, immovable property taxable. Now, what is the meaning of the word property? Property means a capital asset, namely immovable property, share securities, jewellery, drawing, painting, sculpture, work of any art, bullion. That is a gold biscuit kind of thing. So, the point to be noted is whatever is not called as property, if you receive that, even though from non relative, even though for crores and crores of rupees, it is never taxable. For example, I received rural agricultural land in India, I received stock in trade, watch, movable asset like car, fridge, AC, TV, mobile phone. It is not a capital asset as per the definition and hence it is never taxable also. Are you understanding this people, yes or no? One more point to understand, which I haven't covered in capital gain chapter because it is linked to this gift income topic. If at the time of receipt of any gift, it is taxable to you. Then while selling that particular property in future, the cost of acquisition will not be the cost of previous owner. It will be that fair market value or stamp duty which you have taken while computing IFOS income. That is written under section 49 subsection 4. So if I receive any gift from non-relative, I will be paying tax in IFOS chapter on the fair market value or stamp duty. Then that fair market value or stamp duty will become my cost of acquisition for the future capital gain. That station rule. How but if at the time of receipt of gift it is not taxable because I would have received at the time of my marriage or I would have received from relative and I am selling that in the future. Then for me the cost to previous owner will become my cost of acquisition 49 subsection 1. If you are applying 49 subsection 1 period of holding from previous owner and if you are applying 49 subsection 4 pre period of holding from you only current owner. Are you understanding this table people yes or no? So mind well this is linked with capital gain chapter and very important also for exam. Now there are certain kind of income which you don't show to the government but still government can find out. And if government is finding that income or expenditure or your investment 
which you haven't recorded in books or you are showing in the books in very wrong manner and you cannot explain the purpose of that the nature of that transaction it will be treated as unexplained income expense or investment which will be taxable at the rate of 78% i repeat it will be taxable at the rate of 78% under section 115 bbe see what i have written section 68 cash credit if you receive anything in the books as a loan and you don't repay it for years and years you can't give the explanation also it is called as cash credit unexplained investment if you have recorded some investment or if you haven't recorded any investment in the books but you have that but you haven't recorded you have any money jewelry bullion with you but you haven't recorded in the books you haven't done the payment through bank account if you have some of the investment which is not fully recorded in the books or you have incurred some expenditure but that expenditure is also not recorded in the books this income this investment this loan amount this expenditure it will be treated as unexplained amount against this unexplained amount no deduction will be allowed without taking any deduction without taking any expenditure without taking any rebate without taking any shifting benefit it will be taxable under section 115 bbe at the rate of 60% plus on that compulsory 25% surcharge plus on that compulsory 4% health and education says totaling to 78% are you understanding this people yes or no then section 57 see up to now we saw that which incomes are generally taxable in ifrs but against this incomes you will get certain deductions also Let's say number one. If you are talking about dividend income, any dividend income from domestic company, foreign company, etc., etc., against this dividend income, you can claim only one expenditure, and that is interest expenditure. You know, you have taken a loan to purchase the shares, and you are paying interest on that loan. Then, from that dividend income, you can get deduction of this interest expense, but the maximum deduction that you can get is twenty percent of this dividend income. so against dividend income only one expenditure interest expense or 20% of dividend whichever is lower if you have given plant machinery furniture building on rent against that you can deduct repairs insurance premium for depreciation etc if you are getting family pension that is pension of some other family member but you are receiving that then how much deduction you will get from that family pension 15000 per annum or one third of that family pension whichever is lower so if let's say i am receiving pension because of any of my family member who is no more in the world then that pension will not be taxable for me in salary chapter it will be taxable in ifrs let's say i am receiving per year 1 lakh 50000 then what will be the deduction one third of this 150 that is 50000 or fix 15000 whichever is lower 15000 so deduction will be 15000 but if i am following section 115 bac i can't claim this standard deduction i have already covered that interest on compensation you will get flat 50% and last any other income if you have against that you can claim any expenditure provided it should be incurred wholly and exclusively to earn that income and it should not be a capital expenditure it should be normal revenue expenditure now certain expenditures are there which you cannot deduct against your ifos income in pgbp we have already seen see can i say in pgbp personal expense you can't get deduction then if you are giving any interest or salary outside india then and if you are not deducting tds 100 percentage of that expenditure you don't get deduction if you are paying certain amount within india to a resident person and you don't deduct tds 30 percentage of that expense you don't get it as a deduction if you pay certain amount to your relative over and above fair market value the excess payment will be disallowed or you are making payment of any expenditure in a single day to a single person exceeding rupees 10000 otherwise then by account pay check account pay draft ecs or other electronic mode that entire expense will be disallowed whatever disallowances i have said all of them are covered in section 58 personal expense 100% of amount paid outside india without tds 30% if paid to resident without tds disallowances like 48a2 and 48a3 payment to relative and payment more than 10000 and against casual income also you cannot claim any kind of expenditure under section 
so that was the important topics of ifos i have covered almost 90 percentage of the chapter and that is what important for the revision is thank you so much